Thank you for tuning in with Learning the Language with B. My name is Brennan McKay and I am your host. Quick introduction. I am a two-spirit individual from the Pine Creek First Nation, currently residing here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, right now I work for the Urban Shaman Art Gallery and doing an indigenous language project called the Speech Act Project. So the Speech Act Project is where we revitalize the languages in the landscape as well as the digital landscape, aka social media. So Word of the Day was our way of sharing that language through our platform, also by doing this mini-series along with it, so you can hear the language and how the words we shared are pronounced. So today I have joining me is Miss Liz Garlicky. Welcome Liz, nice to see you. How's it going? Good, thanks so much for having me, Brennan. You're very welcome, nice to have you here. Uh, so uh, Liz, share a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name is Liz Garlicky. I'm the Outreach Coordinator here at Urban Shaman Gallery for about 10 years. Uh, I'm first-generation Canadian, my parents are Polish, and I do speak a little bit of Polish. Sweet, awesome. Thank you. Uh, so today we're going to be learning how to pronounce the language from one of our language keepers, Mr. Frank Bolio from the Sandy Bay First Nation here in Manitoba. Um, Thanks, Frank. Yeah, he helped us with our audio recordings. First word. Great spirit. Kichi manedu. Kichi manedu. Kichi manedu. Kichi manedu. Kichi manedu. Kichi manedu. I got manadu. it pretty well. And oh, the, and I think I got it. How about you, Liz? Let's see. Kichi manedu. Yeah, you got it. Manadu. Great right. spirit. Sweet. I hope I remember it. It's kind of hard, but I, I, I'm guessing the, the audience is probably going to have this and repeat it over and over and over and over again like I would. So, getche manadu. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, sounds, that, uh, that was a little bit better. Sounds like, yeah, sounds like Frank. <laughs> Aw, thanks, Frank. I'm going right. to keep on saying that. <laughs> All right, next word. See? Gizik. I like how it goes. He goes Gizik. Very small, very short, very easy to pronounce. Yeah, I'm thankful for that. Very. Gizik. Let's hear it again. Cedar. Gizik. 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 I am thankful for my Gizik that I'm offering. Gizik. Cool. Put it in the sentence. That is me. Yeah. Music. <laughs> All right. Next word. Sage. Mashkote bijike wingashkosun. Mashkote bijike wingashun. Whoa. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> That's a really long word for. In, in Ojibwe compared to a short version, which, which is English, sage, like that's crazy. I don't know how, I, I where did it come from? Uh, like Right, like I, I wonder the same thing. And if the translation is word for word or if it's kind of a description of sage, like fuzzy leaves or whatever like that, I, I'm wondering if, if Frank could uh, give us that information, which would be kind of cool. We'll try it one more time. You try it one more time there. One more time. Let's try it. Mashkode. Mashkode. Bijike. Bijike. Wingoshin. Wingoshin. Nice job. Anyways, uh, next word. Tobacco. Ase ma. Ase ma. Ase ma. Ase ma. Tobacco. Tobacco. Bringing it down, man. Sweet. Let's hear that one more time. Tobacco. Asema. 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 And that that'll that you'll definitely be using that a lot. Yeah. If you're doing if you're doing any kind of like burning of your tobacco and offering the tobacco. So Asema. Asema. <laughs> Sweet. So how many more words do we have? Sweetgrass. Oh, sweetgrass. We got sweetgrass. Wingoshun. 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 
Truman. Gosh. Well, oh, Frank's gonna be looking at this and he's gonna go, "What is going on with this lady?" <laughs> I'm I'm learning. So uh, for We're me, both learning. yeah, it's I know that we don't have Frank here to tell us, but for me to to comfortably do it at home, I think that that's an important thing to do, and then try it out with friends who do know how to speak the language. Yeah, so, definitely. Just walk around your house saying, pronouncing these words, mm-hmm. especially for for you those at home. That's it. Yeah. Well, you know what? I have a feeling that what was it? Wingush. Wingoshing. Wingo We're gonna have to say it again. Let's, Let's do it again. It. One, one more time. One, one more time. Sweet grass. Wingoshun. 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 Yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> I definitely so that was our. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and our join us again next week as we learn Cree. Same words, but in Cree this time. Ooh, we challenge ourselves. So, hope to see you guys next week and practice these words at home, guys. Bye. Today we're going to be learning, doing the four medicines in the Cree language. The recordings are done by Mr. Ken Palpanikas from Norway House. And today I have my good friend, Mr. Anders Swanson. So Anders, wow, thanks. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself a little bit. Oh geez, what do you want to know? So, uh, well for work I um, uh, do a lot of work with something called Winnipeg Trails, um, as you know. Right, and right. Um, I mostly work on sustainable transportation. I'm part of a big movement of people in Winnipeg and around the world that's trying to fix um, how we move uh, and make it a bit better of a city, a better place. That's what I mostly do. My background, I'm an artist. I was born in Flin Flon, moved when I was one, decided I didn't like it. So I'm really honored to be here. and. Uh, yeah, hopefully I don't screw anything up. <laughs> well, it's really awesome to have you here. Thank you for that introduction. Man, it was deadly. All right, so our first word is... The, the Great Spirit. The Great Spirit. So let's hear it now in the language. Kisiasa. 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 Kisiasak. Let's see, try it. Let's see, let's try it. Let's see, here, Ali. Here, you do it. Kisiasak. 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 Oh no, it sounds more like Khatian. Kisiasak. 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 Yeah, it does. Hey, a little bit. How long he maybe it? he just has coffee in his throat or something, so we gotta be careful. We'll double check with him, but probably. <laughs> <laughs> I know sometimes sure I sound sounds like, like that. Sure, sounds like a to me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's just listen to it one more time then okay. and try it. Kisiasak. Oh yeah. Like reading it, it says on our paper K, but I think that the sound when he says it is. Kha. Of course, maybe somewhere else speaking Cree, they pronounce more like a G, or that happens a lot. So you kind of gotta. Be loose, and that's why I think. So when you say, "Am I good at speaking?" That? Who cares? As soon as you speak it, you're good at it. You're doing it. Yeah. And and as long as you can make yourself understood. So our next word is. It's the cedar. The cedar. And let's hear it. Inanatic. 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 That's weird because it's ending in K too, but then now it sounds like KK. 
right? It's like a clear case, not like or just a dry throat. In an attic. 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 Theater. In an attic. That is a very interesting one. So let's hear it again. In an attic. In an attic. In an attic. Cool, 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 cool. So our next word is sage. And in the language, it sounds. Muskusi. It sounds like. Muskusi. Oh. Muskusi. It sounds like Natawe Hawe Muskusi. Natawe Muskahi. Muskahi. That's what it sounds like he's saying it. Yeah. Natawe Hawe Muskusi. Muskahi. Muskahi. Yeah. And he said it sounds. Natawe Hawe Muskahi. Natawe Hawe Muskahi. And he also said this the healing medicine. Was that the direct literal translation of that? I wonder. Um, questions to ask to our elders. Uh huh. Gotta ask that question for sure next time. So, our next word is. Tobacco. Tobacco. And in the language, it sounds like. Chistemao. 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 <laughs> That's a good one to know if you're in uh, Cross Lake, two o'clock in the morning after a party, and really badly want a cigarette. I guess that's different, though. What's is there a different word between tobacco and cigarette? I bet you. Must I bet be. you there probably is definitely. Yeah, because this is about medicines, right? So yeah, could be different. Hmm. Yeah, I would believe that tobacco would be probably processed for a cigarette, not like traditional medicine. Got tobacco. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's hear how it sounds again, please. Just Chistemao. 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 So, this is really great for me because I did some lessons with Ken mm -hmm. before, and uh, he's a teacher at university too. And um, <clears throat> that C I S at the beginning, that's how I assumed it was pronounced as Sistemao. But I learned that, like, for example, the Cree for boat is Tsiman. Tsiman. It starts C I. So C's are different. Like when they start a sentence, they're like, tch, tch. and I can't say it the way he can. He's like, he like it's, it's like a C H T S or something. Like it's this neat sound. Right. <laughs> can we listen to that one more time? I want to hear yeah. him say it. Let's hear it. Systemal. 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 Oh yeah. Cool. Yeah. Definitely. So I'll remember that. Me too, definitely. And you guys practice these at home too, hey? So our next word is... Sweetgrass. Sweetgrass. And let's hear it. or So you can say it either way. Nipawaskusi or... Siswaskusi. Let's hear it again. Nipawaskusi. Nepoaskusi. Or. Or siwaskusi. Or siwaskusi. So, uh, what do you think of like today's lesson of words, Cree words? I think you should add somebody else. I mean, I'm just too honored to be here talking about the medicines <laughs> and like, uh, you know, white guy trying to learn it. It's like, so do this again with somebody who knows the answers. Uh, um, for me, it was really, really fun. And actually, I don't think you and I have ever tried to say anything to each other together as much as you know we've yeah. both been around it and knowing the work that you're doing so i don't know i just I, I think it's a great thing for people to just do just take these five things sit down with somebody else and say it out loud and listen right um it's why winnipeg trails is working on the, the the language connection to the land and trying to get more ways for people to do it we got some special stuff coming out so um i just thought this is a great chance to kind of introduce those ideas and and be a part of the project you're working on i really really appreciate it all right, guys, thank you for joining us today. Um, next week, we'll be doing uh, Ojibwe with my good friend, Janelle Henry. And I want to thank Mr. Anders Swanson again for being here. So, yeah, have a fun time learning Cree at home this week, guys. See you guys again. Bye.
Thank you for joining today's episode of Learning the Language with B, episode number three. So today we have my good pal, Miss Janelle Henry. Come on out, Janelle. Mm-hmm. Welcome. Hey, hey, how are you? Welcome, 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 welcome. Thank, Thank you for being here. Thank you. So, Janelle, mm-hmm. introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, yeah. So my name is Jadel Henry. Um, what else about me? Uh, I'm from Rose River Anishinaabe First Nation, and I live here in Winnipeg. And I currently work here at Urban Shaman Gallery as a project coordinator for our language revitalization project. And I work with this guy. <laughs> we work together, yeah. <laughs> so this is a way of um, bringing the language to you guys so you guys can hear it. So, yeah, because did you actually know that it's the International Decade of Indigenous Languages from 2022 to 2020, no, 2022 to 2032, um, UNESCO is doing this, this campaign to help revitalize Indigenous languages all over the world. So we really want to do our part. I'm Ojibwe, and... I don't really speak that much Ojibwe, and like I've tried, but it's just been kind of hard, and I don't know. I need help. I definitely need help. <laughs> help. We, <laughs> we all need help learning <laughs> the language. So thankfully, we have our elder, Mr. Frank Bolio, who took the, took the time out of his day to come on down and do some recordings. So that's who we're listening to. He's so awesome, too. He is. He is. So today, we're going to listen to five words. And yeah, learn them with us at home. So the first, I guess, not word, but place name we're going to be uh, listening to is Assiniboine Park. Ooh, I like it there. So let's listen. Assiniboine Park. Assiniboine, a key nun. Assiniboine, a key nun. Assiniboine, a key nun. Yeah. Assiniboine Park. A city boy, a key nun. A He kind of says a city a city boy in a little bit different, and I noticed in the spelling it was a little bit different. It kind of re- reminded me of like you know when people say guan, like guan, guan, get out of here. Like, guan like that's what it looked like. So a city boy, I think we got to have that little bit in there, just for some you know some spice. Just kidding. <laughs> 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 or what would it be called like? Um, your uh, when someone has an accent, so like the accent of the language, because you know <laughs> if you're just speaking the language, if you go back to the res and then you come back, you have your res accent. Right. 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 Just kidding. Right. <laughs> Don't deny your res <laughs> accent. <laughs> yeah, you do. We all have good res <laughs> accent. So, but uh, let's listen to that last part one more time. A city boy, a key none. A a a a a Interesting. Cool. All right. So this next word is buffalo. <laughs> Let's listen. Buffalo. Mashkode bijike. Mashkode bijike. Mashkode bijike. Mashkode bijike. Mashkode bijike. I got the right on. I just need a no burger now. <laughs> and just put it together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just go to a restaurant. Can I get a, a mushkete? Bishik, bishiki. Okay, I got it. Play it again. Play it again. Mushkete, bishiki. Bishiki. Mushkete, bishiki. Mushkete, bishiki. Burger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you go to a restaurant, you'll, you'll say. Can I get a mushkete bijike burger? <laughs> they'll look at you like, what? <laughs> what is she even talking? What? Is she, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> For real. <laughs> so mm. like, next. Okay, we'll move on to our next word, which is the weather. So, mm. so first word, it's cold. It's cold. Gisena. 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 My heat Freezing. went out the other day at home and oh, it was Gisena. <laughs> 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 right it's on. fixed now though. It's right fixed. On. <laughs> right on. All right, let's one more Gisena. time. Gisena. One more time for these guys. 
<laughs> it's called Gesena. 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 So that's why you say it's cold. Gesena. What's our next word? Our next word is phrase. Well, it's hot. Now that my heat's fixed, it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's hot. Gijede. 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 Sweet. I can't wait. Now that it's spring, it's going to be all gijede out. Pretty soon we survive the winter. For real. <laughs> For real. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Our last uh, phrase, phrase of the day would be, it's a nice day. So, let's listen. It's a nice, beautiful day. Menogi shigan. 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 Sweet, Sweet. That's how you say have a good day. Who well, can say it faster? Hey. Mini Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, thank you. Sweet. Thank you for joining me that today. That was good. I know more words now. I'm getting there. Me too. I have like <laughs> 10 words. Well, yeah, 10 words added to my vocabulary now in Ojibwe. <laughs> so that's awesome. Stay tuned. Join us again next week for Cree. Cool. So, <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned, you guys. Thanks Have for coming. Keep learning at home. <laughs> I want to see you do your spin one more time. One <laughs> more time, spin. Rewatch the video if you have to. <laughs> learning language with B. Learning My language turn. with B. My <laughs> turn. Welcome to the second episode of Learning the Language with B. Today we're going to be learning Cree with my good friend, Dana Warren. Come out, Dana. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? Hey, it's going good. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Exciting. So, Dana, tell us a little about yourself. Sure. Yeah, my name is Dana Warren. Um, I am the current director at the moment uh, at Urban Shaman, but I only have a week left now. And this is one of the final projects I get to work on, which is really, really beautiful experience. So. Right on. Well, we're happy to have you here. Sweet. Awesome. So we will be hearing rec uh, recordings from Mr. Ken Papanicus. Okay. So he also like gives like a little brief description on the words. So we'll be hearing that a little bit in the recording. So. So let's do this. Sure, let's, let's do this. Let's learn these words. <laughs> you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, our first word is Assiniboine Park. So let's listen. Assiniboine Park, Park literally means a stony Indian. That's a man like a forest. Assiniboine Park is a Assiniboine Forest. So how does he say it again? Assiniboine Park. Assiniboine Park. A one pot. But a Sinewe pot literally means a stony Indian. Hmm. What's he had? That's a man like a forest. A Sinewe pot, what she had is a Sinewe forest. A Sinewe. Hmm. Interesting. That's how you hmm. say that. <laughs> a Sinewe pot. Does that what sounds? Next <laughs> way. <laughs> cut that out. It's buffalo. <laughs> Yay, Tatanka! <laughs> <laughs> so let's hear how we how he says it and it's what he has to say. Yeah. 
too hard to pronounce. I yeah. mean, they were very good. Yeah. So maybe for you guys at home, you can practice saying these words as well. And yeah, I encourage you guys too. They're easy enough. <laughs> They're easy enough. So. Yeah. <laughs> but I'd like to thank my good friend Dana Warren for being here. Thank, thank you again. You. And then we'll see you guys again next week for the third episode. For, and join us for, that'll be Ojibwe. So yeah, stay tuned. Join in. See you guys.
I want to say welcome to everyone to the newest and Indigenous owned hotel that's built on Winnipeg's first urban reserve. So really exciting to acknowledge that. Um, the hotel is owned by Long Plain First Nation. It was originally purchased in 2006 and became urban reserve in 2013 and this hotel is fairly new, just opened this year. So um, just wanted to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge the strength and resilience of our ancestors for without them we wouldn't be here to carry on their legacies to share what they've passed on to us and so for this evening and for every day I invite you to think of them and thank them and walk in a good way and most importantly be kind and supportive to each other on this language learning journey. My name is Jessica Dumas and I'll be the MC for this evening, so I'm really excited to be here with everyone. Uh, we're going to start with an opening prayer by Carolyn Moore. And so, Carol, if you would make your way to the stage, please. She's from Saging First Nation and goes by two spirit names, Blue Sky Woman and Morning Star. So welcome to Carol Moore. Bonjour everybody. Uh, it's really dangerous to have a mic in front of me. I might start singing Patsy here. <laughs> Do it! <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think you'd like that too much. Uh, it's such an honor to be here this evening and, and with such great people and how important our language is and to continue on. I know my husband was last generation residential school and when I asked him to teach myself and my sons the language, he said, oh, they're not going to need it. It's not even going to be important anymore, he said. And my son graduated self-governance and he sure would have loved to have had his language. And it's, you don't know how much I appreciate that the language is going to be carried on to urban shaman and all the language gifted elders that we have, miigwech. I talk more than I pray, so I'll, I'll do a prayer now and I'll bless the food and, and uh, make a spirit plate and then we'll continue on with all the wonderful gifts that are going to be given. Creator, it's Oshawish Gogish Gokwe. Wabanu Nung Dishnakas Wawashkashi Dudam. Creator, as we're standing here today amongst these honorable people, miigwech, miigwech, and help them to continue on. When I light my pray, when I light my pipe, I pray all the time that our minds will continue till our, our last journey home. So walk with us, keep us safe and and help us in our journey and guide us now, in the future, until the end. Ho ho miigwech, all my relations. Thank you, everyone. Miigwech, thank you so much. Miigwech, Carol Moore of Saging First Nation. Next, I would like to invite Jolene Jojo Wilson, who's going to share some welcoming songs from Treaty 2 territory. Same region that I'm from, Treaty 2 territory, Hisikun and First Nation. So welcome to Jolene. <laughs> uh, that's a hard act to follow, but I'll do my best. <laughs> So um, I figure it's important to call the ancestors in to be with us today on this special day. So we'll start with that.
nervous in a room full of beautiful people. <laughs> I don't know. Why. I'm like feeling all weird and stuff. <laughs> 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 oh man um oh boy okay all right um so i just um because we're here to honor um all these beautiful language keepers and i can tell you that um i'm really grateful that you're all here uh, i'm a learner um i've been um actively trying to seek out my language uh, best as i can um, I call my mother often to uh, say things to her and sometimes I'm saying the wrong thing but you know it makes her laugh it makes her happy to know that I'm seeking my language um, and and these songs these songs were my start my beginning to my journey to uh, retrieve my mother's tongue so um, these songs are really important to me and so um, I want to say thank you um, so with that, I'm going to sing the thank you song. <clears throat> oh, it's gone. Where'd it go? Somebody help me. <laughs> uh oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hey, away, hey, away, hi, oh. Hey, away, hey, away, hi, oh. Hey.
this evening. Thank you for coming out to the Sacred Sounds Gathering in honor of the language keepers who have been working with the Urban Shaman Contemporary Aboriginal Arts with the Sacred Sounds Project, the uh, Speech Act Project, and More Than Words. It's important for us to acknowledge our sponsors that made this evening possible, so thank you to the Winnipeg Foundation's Reconciliation Grant, the Seaweed Band, who we'll hear from later tonight, the Benevity Fund. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Debbie's excited. And the Assiniboine Credit Union. So we have a short video that we're going to share with you right now. So if the guys at the back are ready to go, then uh, watch the screen for Welcome to Speech Trails video. Dante. Hello. How are you? Dante. To the thumb is I welcome you. I am here in Mescanoma. This is Speech Trails. I am here in Mescanoma. It's a very nice day. Let's go outside. Okay, ready? Let's do this. But here, you're not, you're using another part of your body, which is to push yourself. So this is what, you're assisting your movement with your other part of your body. That's why you have that so scrape also, and, you know, to push yourself on that. Mm -hmm. But when you're skating, and as you're just sliding on the ice with your feet, here you're pushing as well. And that's why the word is different. The root is in there about sliding. So, Sliding was. means something slippery. So here you're pushing yourself to slide, but when you're skating, you're just simply just gliding or not. So. Hey guys, Brendan McKay here. I'm here to chat with you quickly on about Winnipeg's indigenous languages that were and are still here in the area today. My name is Frank Bolio, my traditional name is Angirek, and um, my, my spirit name is Makoa. Bizindadiwag is part of the Speech Act Project and aims to advance the knowledge of Indigenous language and encourage people to listen and learn in the context of the land. Language is more than sounds ordered and arranged. It contains whole worlds, perspectives, and cultural understanding in order to live in relation to the rest of creation. Creating that opportunity to spend time um, and in a public place where there's uh, you know, where it's open to anyone. Anyone could go there. And now being able to design in many different types of spaces and scales of projects where indigeneity is part from part of the project from the beginning.
I think that the integration of indigenous knowledges can happen in many in many ways, you know, and that we're not relegated to traditional forms or stereotypes about what our architecture is, but that our ways of thinking, our ways of being, our ways of experiencing um, can actually breed a whole range of different expressions in architecture. And that's exciting. Um, so these pieces are, are built out of core 10, which is weathering steel. And essentially what it does is once we're, this is fully built and welded solid, then um, it gets sandblasted to, to create a uniform surface on the material. And then when it sits outside, it rests to a point of protecting the material. So normal steel will rest all the way through, whereas Core 10 will, will rest uh, to create an oxidized layer on the material, and then it doesn't allow it to rest anymore. So it has a, a long lifespan but it, um, it still gives you that protection um, with the material. It also allows you to not have to refinish it every time. If you paint it or something, you gotta refinish you know, every few years kind of thing. So this could really sit out there indefinitely. And Getting down to the, the basics of what is language and what is it in terms of as a, not only a communication device for sound and ideas, but also what is contained within the worldviews uh, that those languages represent. So that app is available on the app store. I checked it out myself, so you should download it. Um, but if you don't use the Apple store, then I don't know if you can ask, because if you're not using an iPhone, then who are you? <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's time to start the recognition of the language keepers that we're here to honor tonight. And to do that, I'd like to invite to the stage Janelle Henry, who's the former project coordinator for Sacred Sounds, the Speech Act, and More Than Words, and Brennan McKay, who is the former research assistant for Sacred Sounds, the Speech Act, and the current project coordinator for More Than Words, who will introduce the Urban Shaman's language revitalization initiatives. So welcome to Janelle and Brennan. Hi guys, how's everybody doing? <laughs> <laughs> so Urban Shaman Contemporary Aboriginal Art Gallery and Winnipeg Trails Association are two organizations that have stepped up to support Indigenous language revitalization here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1 territory. You've seen some of the fun work we've had with the Learning the Languages with B, that the videos that played as you walked in here. You could also see them up in Brennan's exhibition, De Four Seasons, which is up at the gallery right now. So go on, go see them when you have a chance. These fun videos stemmed from the Speech Act Project, a multidisciplinary program that everyone here helped with. Our objective with this work was to get anyone interested in Indigenous languages to say a word or a paragraph in their heads or out loud. Mm. The Speech Act had three main activities, gallery translations, all exhibition write-ups into two indigenous languages, Ryan Gorey's Bajindadiwag, a language art installation overlooking the Red River in North Point Douglas, and Speech Trails, an app where you learn the language on the land. The Bajindadiwag and Speech Trails program were all promoted in five languages, Ojibwe, Cree, Mechif, Dakota, and French. We had a year-long grant to do this work. Thank you to Canadian Heritage, the Indigenous Languages Initiative. The work took us just over two years. Hashtag COVID. <laughs> so COVID was a challenge. Um, implementing languages that have no standardization in our current world was a challenge. Um, not speaking our language was a challenge, but definitely the biggest challenge was time, the race against time. 
When we started these language revitalization projects, there's the three of them, we thought a bit about the past, the present, and the future. And we thought about the past and how it wasn't so easy to be Indigenous. It wasn't so accepted as it was as it is today. And so that's why we're here, to celebrate the language keepers who kept the language alive in times when language and identity were hidden for survival. So it's important for us to acknowledge that you guys didn't get federal funding. We did. We heard what your generation got and uh, no thank you, we're good. So that's why, so that's what the Sacred Sounds Gathering is for, to honor your legacy. Thank you all so, so much. much for working with us. And uh, yeah, just thank you guys, uh, everyone who took part in this. Thank you. We couldn't have done it without you, like at all. So <laughs> thank you. So don't go very far. You guys can see right here. So um, we're going to get into our presentations now, and uh, and these two are going to help us out. So um, this will be the space that we'll invite our language keepers up to and do our best to give you the, the a safe space right here. So the first person that we'd like to welcome up is Frank Bolio, treaty from Sandy Bay Jibwe First Nation. Well, yeah. Applause for Frank. Located three hours northwest of Winnipeg, Frank was raised by his grandparents where Ojibwe was the first language and culture was a part of everyday life. The gifts he gained for survival came from the skills he learned over the summer surviving while hunting, gathering herbs and meat. Today Frank is working with seven First Nations in Manitoba where he provides interpreting, translating and written orthography to create and provide Ojibwe writing for further documenting. He continues his efforts in teaching and working towards survival for our Ojibwe language, working hard hand in hand with the English writing system. So congratulations, Frank, and thank you so much for all of your work. So feel free to, yeah. yeah. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, ripped it right off. <clears throat> Ah, chingi chi na ndo mama. Ah, ah, ino ngoma be ni bo yang ge nin. Mi ge ge te bo e wa i ko ai ke do nin du ji bi ge, da ni ji bi ge. Shi go be no ngi ke no mo ke go ge ta de si se ko shi o de sa ke go ta go. It's a uh, it's an honor and a privilege to uh have this opportunity to work in the, in this line of work that I do. My first language is is, is Ojibwe and uh my grandfather, my grandmother, who will raise me since uh, two, two years old, I, uh, I never got a chance to, uh, never learned uh, English language till around nine years old. Nine, nine years old, I was able to, uh, uh, able to pick up the you know, words here and there. But today, I have an opportunity. I'm with uh, Treaty One Nation, uh, Treaty One Nation Development Program, where project where I work with uh, all the frontline directors, uh, chief directors, and director of governance, in in order to uh, uh, move on, moving forward of our Nawe uh, Udena, uh, and there that we'll have the opportunity of all the seven nations. Uh, uh, the children will name these streets. The children will have the opportunity to learn the language. And uh, the people that I teach today are are moving forward as well. I'm I'm privileged to do that as well. Kichimi watch to the Creator. Kichimi watch the drum this morning. Kichimi watch. Tago udan na miya awa again na miya. Kichimi watch kaya ingit nand. Brendan. Kichimi watch Brendan. Yours from Urban. And then Brendan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Congratulations, Frank. And thank you. All right, we'd next like to acknowledge Lorraine Cotu, who isn't with us this evening, but her daughter Andrea Talu is here and she's going to uh, receive it on her behalf. I'll say a little bit about Lorraine. Lorraine is a Michif French elder who was born and raised in St. Laurent, Manitoba, where she went to school and raised her family of four girls. She then graduated with honors at Red River College. In 2011, Lauren and Lorraine, sorry, and four other ladies from St. Laurent got together to write the Michif French language dictionary, which had never been written before, in order to preserve their language and culture. They met every Tuesday to write their book. Five years later, July 2016, they self-published their Michif French dictionary, and the ladies did it all on their own with no funding, which seems like a, a theme that all of uh, everyone ahead of us did on their own, thank goodness. Lorraine has been involved in teaching language sessions in St. Laurent School, the local Head Start program, working with Michif poet Suzanne Steele Gaudry and composer ne Neil Weinsenel to translate the musical Le Cure, Riel's Heart of the North, into Michif French. She's also working on a second book doing crafts, beading, embroidery for slippers and mitts and small purses. So welcome to Andrea Tayu on behalf of Lorraine Cotu. Hello. Um, on behalf of my mom, I, uh, she asked me to read a little something. So I'll start right now. Uh, um, my mom was born in 1946 in St. Laurent, Manitoba. Her parents are Butchis and Mary Lavallee. They taught her how to speak Michif French and, and it was the only language that uh, she spoke at home until she went to school. Uh, she lived in a log house uh, next door to Seminet School where she started grade one and her grandparents lived next door and her family all around her. Uh, her nuns were teachers and her nuns uh, the nuns taught her how to speak Quebec French and English. She wasn't allowed to speak much of French at school. And um, the nuns also told her that her language is not the right way. And uh, okay. um, yeah, so uh, like, like um, Jessica said that uh, she persevered and I'm, oh, this is so emotional. <laughs> She, she persevered and she's a tough little cookie who was born uh, only two pounds and uh, she, she did so much. She's a strong and, um, oh, I didn't think I'd get so emotional, but yeah, she, she did so much in her life and she's a strong person and she raised all us kids to be um, proud of our language and our culture, which we are. And uh, she she teaches us our language too and I text her and I text her in Michif and she texts me right back and she said okay spell it like this but say it like this so when I can text it I know I understand it she she did that for us like we can understand it but we can't speak it so she's teaching us how to write it now and she's teaching us how to uh, say it too. So we're getting there slowly, but I'm glad I have her in my life and um, uh, to teach the language and to make the book so that it's it's not a forgotten uh, language that it's going to be going on forever and uh, with books and apps and, and things like that. So thank you and um, I'll take her her gifts in in um, in, in uh, her honor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I heard she likes cream. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Stay down here for a photo. Your mom is so nice. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations on having such a cool mom. And it's really nice when you come up and you share your emotion that way because the work that she's contributed for her life is emotional. And 
to have that language and that dictionary and to have you here sharing that is really incredible. So thank you for doing that. Um, so I believe we have, um, we're going to shift names around a little bit because of our attendance. So I'm going to invite Ken Papanikis from Norway House, Manitoba, if he'll make his way to the front. He was born into a family of four boys and four girls. He had many travels on the river before arriving at Toulon Collegiate and Garden City Collegiate and eventually earned academics such as Bachelor of Arts with a major in Psychology from the Brandon University, a Bachelor of Education and Cross-Cultural Education in 1976 from the University of Manitoba, a Master's of Education in Cross-Cultural Education and Administration in 1982 from the University of Manitoba. Before then and before gaining all of his grade 12 credits, he already had the opportunity to teach. He was the Vice Principal of Jack River School, the Principal of Norway House High School, a consultant for Native Languages Frontier School Division and taught at Brandon University in the Faculty of Education. Joseph returned to Norway House to be an area superintendent for three years and officially retired from the public school education system in 2005 and has since been teaching the Cree language at the University of Manitoba in addition to doing translations for many organizations. So Ken, if you would please make your way to the front, feel free to share a couple of words, but thank you so much for your work. I was told to make this short and sweet. I can make it. I can make it short, but I'm not sure if I can make it sweet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I come from uh, from uh, th speaking as a teacher of the language, and also while uh, having worked with teachers who teach the native language. In this case, it was Cree. And it's interesting to see all this evolving. When I first started teaching many years ago, I attended a conference in Nipissing, Ontario, and a couple of the presenters, a couple of women, they were uh, they were presenting a, you know, about the very same thing, trying to revive the language. And this was a number of years ago, and those women shared a story that went uh, talked about two elders at one time predicted that our language would slowly disappear, would struggle for many years, but it would revive itself. It's interesting, we're, trying to, we're starting to see this process. I think the TNR has, the Truth and Reconciliations, I think has done a good job to raise the awareness of that whole process. And I think it's encouraging to see what is happening now when I worked as a consultant with the Frontier School Division, I, uh, I was in charge of the native language programs and uh, it was a frustrating job because it was something new that was happening in the schools. I had 12 schools to work with. People always say, oh yeah, I support, but we need to walk the talk and actually support rather than just saying that. Many years ago, there was a conference here in Winnipeg as well. The theme of the conference was uh, saving our languages and our culture. It was put on by the Manitoba Métis Federation. Well, I listened to all the presentations and so on. No one said a word in the native language. And then an MP from Saskatchewan, Mr. Goulet, some of you might remember him. It was his turn to get up and speak. And he did it entirely in Cree. And everybody started getting up to leave because they didn't understand what he was saying. And I think when we say we need to support, I think we need to show that we support, you know, the process of reviving the languages. One of the things that I really concerned about is that people, teachers who teach the language in the schools, they have very little support and usually they work all by themselves. And they need that support. When I sent a memo to those schools, 
One of the things I see when we started in, I think it was around 1984, when they were when we started teaching the languages in the schools, I wrote a letter to the, all the schools in the fall and said, "This is a way, one way to support our language programs." Each morning, after announcements, have a Cree word or Ojibwe word for the day. Only one school followed up with that idea, and the school that did. Well, they told me they had fun because the principal needed some help to pronounce those words. But I think he was very supportive of it. So, and I, as I said earlier, teachers need the support. And I think there's a desperate need for professional development for current teachers because, as I said earlier, they seem to work by themselves and no support. And I think that is, to me, that's a requirement to support and to help them the languages succeed. So to do that, we need to find people, first of all, that are excited about doing it. If a teacher is not excited about doing it, well, it's no sense even to ask those people. But what happened when I worked as a consultant, out of those 12 teachers, I think I only had two that were really excited about it. The rest of them, I quoted in the first publication I did. When I was in that school, I overheard the teacher say, do I have to teach that goddamn Cree? Well, with an attitude like that, how are you going to do a good job? And I think we need to sell that idea, get people that are, inter that are in excited about it, and with a lot of support. One important thing, people always believe that, think that if you speak the language, that's all you need to do. Of course it's important, but you need, like any other subject matter, you need to know enough about it and one of the biggest problems we always had was uh, teachers thought they can go out and buy stuff to teach Cree and Ojibwe they're not out there you have to create your the material uh, yourself and I always used to tell the teachers the best material you can get is the one that you create yourself because it's based on need and not what's available out there because you're not going to find anything and I tried my best to help to create their own the university is the same thing. I just, just before COVID, I was asked to produce two textbooks for the intermediate Cree. And what I did in that one deliberately was I chose vocabulary for each lesson that came from the Cree language, not translated from English to Cree. So it was the reverse was happening. We have verbs in our languages that don't exist in English. So that's the kind of vocabulary I put in there. For example, Panisawe in Cree means to prepare fish for smoking. So stuff like that. But we don't have too many students taking it yet. I will have one student right now and he's a speaker and he's well excited about learning it. So, so we need to do a lot of homework, I think, if we're gonna support, you know, really support the, the process, support the teachers, they need to he hear more than, I'm quoting a parent here, so they're doing more than teaching just words. And that quotation came from a school in southern Manitoba, where they were teaching it in the high school. And the parent came to me and you know, we were evaluating that school is what we were doing. And the parent came to me and said, you know, I'm glad they're teaching the Ojibwe language, but I wish they would teach more than just words. And that's, you see a lot of that. There's very little uh, making sentences out of as models to create conversation, not just say words. And I thought that parent had a very important point. So anyhow, I just want to say if we want to succeed, I think we truly need to support and recognize what the needs are. A lot of people don't. And I think we need to train people to know their know about their language. I think that's very important that people like who I have worked with, and there's not too many of them who have done that, they get excited about doing it. Now you see a lot of little books and just videos online. So that's encouraging. And I think that's uh, the point I made earlier about the language revi uh, reviving itself. I think it's doing it in a very, uh, in a very creative way, but quite often the good things happen in isolation. We need to see what is happening elsewhere. 
and I look online sometimes, I'll, I'll see some of the things what people are doing. Well, we need to see those and then say, well, I'll want to modify it to show up my need, and that's a good attitude to have. Anyhow, I better stop here before they tell me to get off the stage here. <laughs> before somebody says, I get to, that means, <laughs> that means shut up and creep. Okay. <laughs> Can we have a bag for you too? I'll give you down there. Yeah, we were here for a photo. This is your bag. Can you see that increase? Congratulations, Ken, and thanks so much for all of your work. Okay, so we have a pre-recorded video that we're going to play with uh, Solomon Rat. So I think, sorry, we're shuffling a couple of things around because there are a couple of people that are not here this evening. So let me see if I have something for Solomon. All right, so I do have a little something, and then we have a video that we're going to watch from him. So um, Solomon Ratt was born on the banks of Churchill River, just north of the community of Stanley Mission. His parents were hunters and fishers who lived off the land, spending their winters on the trap line and summers fishing in La Ronge. Solomon spent the first six winters of his life with his parents, who didn't speak English. They knew the ways of the land, including the traditional stories passed down through generations, which they told to Solomon and his siblings. At the age of six, Solomon was abducted from his home and taken to the residential school of Prince Albert. He attended Queen Mary School, a school in the community of Prince Albert, while living at the residential residence. After the residential school, he was part of INAC's boarding out program, living in a family's home while attending Riverside Collegiate. After high school, he attended the University of Saskatchewan at the Regina campus. He has two bachelors of arts, one in English literature and another in linguistics, an MA in English literature. He's a recipient of the Saskatoon Order of Merit and the Queen's Platinum Medallion. He's been teaching the Cree language and Cree literature at the First Nations University since 1984 and a full time and full time since 1986. So Solomon has done numerous translations from English to Cree and has had several publications in Cree, including Wood, Woods Cree Stories and Beginning Cree. He loves stories and storytelling. And again, because he can't be with us here this evening, we have a video that we're going to play from Solomon. Then says Solomon Rat in the Sri Carson. I'm a Jewish morning, which is a guy at tea. My dear Magivit knocks Saskatchewan. Nicotica gay, Nictawigan. The gun, the good tossing a gay tattoo punyan, the gay cossy higawin, and the exclamagosian. Oh, tea, I may have a scrumma to Nick. Gestapina Nick, I gave to Tayan, I gave to Tayan, he could drag you up here again. Gisumagosian. My name is Solomon Rad. I was born in Stanley Mission, Saskatchewan, that's in northern Saskatchewan. And I lived there till I was six years old, and then I got taken away to residential school in Prince Albert. And this is where I grew up, and this is where I went to school, or elementary and high school in Prince Albert. But I went home every summer for two months. And because of that, I've been able to retain my language. I've been able to speak my language because my parents spoke nothing but Cree when I was home that two, two, those two months of the year. And I went to the University of Regina and graduated from there. 
and with an English degree. And then I went on to uh, journalism school for a while. And then uh, halfway through journalism school, first semester of journalism school, I got asked to take over a class for a pre-teacher who was sick at the time. So I ended up quitting journalism school and took over the class for this, uh, this pre-instructor. I was 1984. I quit journalism school and continued teaching Cree since 1984. I came on full time for uh, Saskatchewan Indian Federated College, is what it was called back then, and it eventually became First Nations University. And so I came on full time in 1986, and I've been teaching Cree ever oh. since. Like when I first started, we didn't have much material to work with. My mentor, eventually uh, Jane Ogimasis, eventually. She created a workbook and a textbook that we could work with in our university oh. classes. We were using a textbook called uh, that was really inappropriate, culturally inappropriate, and because yeah. there was a lot of religious references on that, and there was a lot of situations where some, something like, uh, "If my husband doesn't listen to me, I'm going to hit him over the head with a frying pan." That oh, was good because at that time, 1984, there was hardly any material available to work with. 1984, there was hardly any uh, First Nations writers, for that matter, you know, speaking, uh, writing in English. Definitely no First Nations people writing in Cree or any other Indigenous yeah. language. At that time, there was very few people uh, doing Cree language instructions in the elementary schools or high schools, for that matter. There's 1984 we're talking about. 1970s. In the 1970s, we uh, uh, we had the Indian control of Indian education going on, and so we had our organization here in Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan Indian Cultural Center. Uh, it is now known as, and they started publishing books in uh, uh, traditional stories, which is really wonderful seeing these traditional stories. But the problem was they were translating these traditional stories into English. There was no Cree. You know, another mentor of mine, a doctor, the late Dr. Ahab Spence, you may have heard of him, and uh, he's been involved in, uh, in language teaching for years before, when I met him. And he told me, you know, when I started out, if you want to you want, if you want to stick to this field, be prepared, stand alone. Because what I found out is that we've had a lot of lateral violence where it comes to our teaching, our methods of teaching. People will always say, that's not how we do it. That's not how we speak that way. That's not how we wrote. And they all were also the famous, the famous overall thing. Cree was an oral language. We shouldn't be writing it. That attitude is still there. We fought with that. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of those teachers I met back in the early 80s stopped teaching and moved on to something else. Those are people who, ta who say that uh, Cree was never a written language, have to think of other nations and their languages. English was never a written language until the 1300s. And it took from the 1300s to 1800s to be to modify that English language to, in the standard way that is understandable by everybody. Every nation in the world had to develop their own writing system. Some nations have been writing for a long time. Cree people and Ojibwe and other First Nations people have only started writing in the past 30 years or so. 1970s, I guess that's 50 years. <laughs> I'm trying to deny, I'm trying to deny my age here. You know, it's only been in the last 50 years, you know, that we started writing Cree. Language is wonderful. Oral language is absolutely the best there is to do. You know, speaking our language is the, is the best way to go about learning the language. But we also need to write the language. We need to provide uh, books for our children to read that they could enjoy for themselves. Writing is a form of communication. And you need to be able to write properly so that people can understand what you're talking about, what, you, what you're trying to communicate. And we can have books, you know, all sorts of books. And so... I spent a lot of time teaching the language. I've been teaching since 1984, full time since 1986. And I've uh, seen uh, an interest in, uh, in Cree language. It was not until the last 10 years that interest picked up. 
And the other work that I've been doing uh, besides my students doing their stuff is translation work. One of the first things that I did translating work was this. Calling Down the Sky by Roseanne. One of your neighbors in, in Winnipeg, Roseanne, Roseanne Deerchild. I hope you know her. So I did the translation of that in Cree. And so she's got the series of poems about residential school. And I got the honor to do the translation to that, which is really good. Another, uh, the, the most recent translation work I've done is a book by Buffy St. Marie, Dabwe. They got my math that was written, Dabwe and the Magic Hat. You could do, get it in English and you could also get it in Cree. And it was really wonderful. And this book is going to be an ebook. We just finished a recording for, for project for it. So it will be a, a, available as an ebook in Cree. And this is something that you didn't even think of way back in 1984, right? <laughs> it's really great. So we have her talking about that. And then one of my uh, Facebook contacts did another book. She self-published a book called, uh, called Our Territories Are Beautiful. And she, she did the artwork and she did the Cree. Uh, she initially did the Cree. And, uh, but then she said to me, I know this is terrible, but could you fix the Cree for me? <laughs> and I was proud that she went ahead, she went ahead and tried to do the Cree version of the story on her own, using what's available online and stuff and her call her contacts in larange and stuff and so i went through it and i was amazed that she actually did very good there was very little i had to do with this thing and so we have we have this book and we also have this as an ebook for that she has you know it's really good another book that I, that I did work on is this one here inconvenient skin i don't know if you know it it won a book prize for translation which is really good and uh, I just love this book, uh, Convenient Skin, by Shane Quaisan. I could never say his name, and I know he's good. But it's wonderful. It's a poem. It's a book. It's in Cree and in English. And then we have this. Secret Stories of the Pikpikis Cree. There's three of us translating this, and uh, which is really good. And uh, I did half a, half a story. They are in English and in Cree. And the painting is done by a high school student in Bixies. So this is just to show you that we've come a long way since 1984. And there's more and more publishers want to do their publications in Cree and in English. And it's so good to see, you know, this is one of the beautiful things to see because we have resources for our future generations to work with. Whereas we didn't have any, you know, like we grew up, the only, the only thing that we looked up to back when I was a kid in the 60s was Tonto. That's one of the things we tried to uh, promote in the early days is signage in our language. I love, I love seeing uh, stop signs in Cree and whatever other indigenous languages there are. Signs of hospital. And thank in Cree. It's good to see this kind of stuff happening. It's something that we never saw when I was a kid. You know, like we didn't even we weren't encouraged to talk Cree in, in when I was a kid. Nowadays we see we see all this stuff anymore. Uh, and that's why I was so um uh, so excited to work with the, the uh, exhibition for for Buffy's uh, artwork to translate that, to be able to see that in the gallery, to see Cree in the gallery which is really wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful to see. This is signage, this is using the language in a, in a, in a, in a good protective way. And people mm -hmm. will be, hey, that's Cree, you know, which is really neat. Even tattoos in Cree. Because <laughs> 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 I, I, I get Facebook posts, I was, hey, how do you, to write this down in Cree? And I'm always tempted to put a, Cree, a, Cree, a swear word in Cree. I haven't done it yet, but I intend to thank you for having me here. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it.
Well, that was fun. Um, I've heard people say that you can't really get the same um, message from someone when you're doing it on Zoom. But if you show them Solomon's message right there, I think that they'll disagree because that was really fun. So on behalf of Solomon, uh, Debbie Keeper, who's the interim director at Urban Shaman, is going to accept his gift tonight. Thank you, Debbie. I just wanted to say... Uh, Thank you, Solomon. That was the most enjoyable hour, the most enjoyable Zoom meeting I have ever had in my life. Uh, we laughed a lot. And uh, the word that we were talking about getting tattooed, kibbutz. <laughs> and he showed me how to write it in syllabics. <laughs> Thank you, Solomon. I hope you're able to uh, watch this evening, and I hope you are enjoying. Thank you so much. Hey. Oh, my baby. <laughs> right, thank you, Solomon. <laughs> Do you the picture? No. All right, so that's the first half of our program. We're going to take a break for dinner, and we're going to have some entertainment in a bit. Um, dinner is going to be outside this door at the back, and if we can please let our language keepers and our knowledge keepers and elders have their dinner first, and then after that, the rest of us will go and enjoy the dinner. So chat with you in a couple minutes.
Department. So I'm going to invite our entertainers to the stage. Hate to interrupt anyone's meal. But for the rest of you, please continue to enjoy your meal. I'm going to <laughs> welcome the United Thunder Square dancers who come from four different communities. The group started using the name United Thunder in 2017, but they've been dancing together for over 15 years, also individually and with other dance groups. The group travels to many communities throughout Manitoba and Saskatchewan. They're a high energy group that'll keep you dancing in your chair the whole night, the whole show. So please welcome them with a big applause. United Square Dancers, United Thunder Square Dancers. Rhythm sections in the can. What's that? Rhythm sections in the can. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just waiting for the big uh, drum line. What is here? Uh, I know. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> You asked the wrong question. <laughs> That's okay. Ryan, I'll give you a bottle. You just throw it at him. <laughs> <laughs>
Yo, tell him to put some fiddle around in there. Down here? I got no mon none in the monitor. Oh, some fiddle, Derek. Derek. Fiddle in the monitor. Fuck, sorry, man, I had a brain for it. How many eight though? Seriously, eight? Eight. eight. <laughs> I can't count. Eight. Eight. I, can't count. I can remember how this one goes. I have to take off another shoe. It's like I'm sinking. Seems a little top end up here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you for having us. Okay, let's hear some more energy. How is everyone doing out there? Yeah, awesome. We're going to get our youngest member here, Miss Hannah Chartrand. Yeah. All the way from Dutch I just <laughs> Okay, here she is. Hannah Chartrand. There we go. Red or red?
How long, Big John? You'll give us, you'll give us a sign or something. I'll give you a wave <laughs> make it, make it really apparent though, because you, you waving all the time. Yeah. Four, Big John, three orange. Three orange. You guys are making me nervous over here. <laughs> All right, you guys ready? <laughs> okay, easy. easy. <laughs> here we go.
Is everybody okay? Square dancers, applause. And you had a sneak peek of our, our music tonight. What? How's that? Am I still on? Um, thank you to the, the sneak peek of our later entertainment, the Seaweed Band. Applause for them. And so uh, if the dancers can just stick close by for some photos, and that would be great. Where's, who, where's our photographers? Do we have our photographers over there? Who else is taking photos just of the group together? That was high energy. Thank you so much, you guys. That was incredible. Thank you so much. All right, so we're going to transition back to our language keepers and uh, give some more acknowledgments there. So I'm going to invite uh, Janelle back to the stage if she can come and Brennan, if, if you're still in the room. Is, is Brennan going to change? <laughs> well, Janelle, maybe I'll help you with the first one until Brennan comes back. Or Debbie, if you could do that. No, we won't need you to say anything. Okay, so we're going to jump into the second half of our program. I'd like to now acknowledge Juan Badi Wakita. If he could please make his way to the front to share a few words. Uh, Juan Badi has spent his lifetime making prayers for people. As a residential school survivor, chief of Sioux Valley Dakota Nation and Sundance chief, Juan Badi has walked many paths. For three decades, he supported inmates in various correctional institutions. Presently, he's the grandfather in residence for the University of Manitoba Access Program. In 2016, he received the Order of Manitoba for his lifelong work to champion a message of healing and unity between all nations. Juan Bidi has been working on Dakota language revitalization since 1965 and is an active member of the Grand Parent Council of the Manitoba Aboriginal Languages Strategy. So congratulations Juan Bidi and thank you so much for all of your work.
You first. <laughs> oh, oh, me talk happy. Yeah. Ik tiedä, että se on sikka he matkaa. No petoa. Ik tiedä, että se ohda kapkina. Hän on takoa kaita hän uu. Oheche. Hän on aja kahana. Et isä hän on hama unipitäjä. Mutin kapi. Ja tu katta kia. Tetsä pitää, hän on oikein kahden kapsin. Ja tukteru hän on, da kota on omu hän on, hän on doha mani pitää hetsäkin. Asia on pettäkin, da on jätsä aie si tsetsä. O kainsera kitena. Tak wakawa, oh ina, oh konsi, ya hece kau dah kape, cantai tan yo makpe, ka taku uspewi cang kau bukan, ah muda nak kuya kape, oh na opi na tangka hece do. E a un si è un chiccio che va a scendere, ad accorto e c'era, o da capo e c'era, da accorto e c'era, da accorto e c'era. E c'è una, tu quasi la tua canta con un cupo in acqua, e io piedi a c'è, e non da accorto e c'è, o è c'è una doha, ma un ipi. Hi, my name is Wambadi Wakita. I am Dakota. I was born in a log house and I grew up with my language. And we lived by the land. <clears throat> I told somebody yesterday that uh, when I was young, we were very rich. We had two outhouses. <laughs> I was uh, glad to be born on a farm. I'm also glad to be part of my grandmother and my grandfather, my mom and dad, and my brothers and sisters who formed together a solid cultural foundation and I got to know that language is culture and that it's important and it's holy and so we get to keep our language despite all the things that has been done to us to take that away I'm glad that I kept that language Earlier on, when I came back to Canada, I started to teach Dakota language at uh, Brandon University. I grew up with that language, so it was an ordinary thing. I also got to know that language is not taught just by one word because of all the, the history and the true stories of long ago and the songs that are involved with that language. It was uh, important to uh, let the people know how we can carry that culture. You know, lately I've been watching my, my nieces and nephews and my grandchildren and they got this, some kind of a phone or a telephone or something in their hand. And they're talking. And they're starting to use their relation. Oh, grandmother. Oh, my son. Oh, my nephew. 
they're starting to talk like that. It was like that long ago where we never mentioned our names, but we called each other by relation. It was good to, to hear that from these young people. We stopped uh, translating English to Dakota because that's what some, some people wanted. And I said, no, you, you, we, we won't do that anymore. We would translate Dakota maybe into English. We found that English is such a, a silly language <laughs> and that it didn't have uh, as much meaning as what I grew up with. You know, uh, long ago, about 150 years ago, when there was Washicho come into contact with us, there was an old man that got the message. And uh, what he said was, these are the laws that Creator gave us. Look at them a little bit closer. That way, the, the spotted eagle will come to take your prayers. Just last, this past year, 2022, when we had ceremony, the message is still the same. Pay closer attention to the laws that Tukashira Tewakantaka gave us. Know the spirit of these medicines. The message is still the same. That's how we keep our language. That's how we keep our culture. For the past 12 years, Dakota people from the Canada and the United States get together every year, twice a year, to somehow speak language. And these past couple of years, they've been talking about how can they protect this culture that Creator has given them. And I was very happy to see that both Canada, United States, Dakota people are really moving along the same road together. I really appreciated that. And I encourage all the young people to follow in those steps. Every year, generation after generation, we would be telling those true stories of long ago in the Dakota language. Just these last few years, five or 10 years ago, now we're starting to share it with other people who wanted to learn or hear. When they asked me, I would gladly share those stories. And uh, I just wanted to uh, say I'm thankful that we're, we're beginning to support one another to, to recognize these, uh, these uh, daku wa ka, something holy that has been given to us. It's truly a, an honor to carry that out on behalf of Tukashira Tawakantaka. Thank you. My relatives, this is me, Grace Juan Buffalo woman, and I'm married to this wonderful guy here. And I, he asked me to say some words, he always does that even though you didn't. But I had some thoughts because I've been learning Dakota language and I'm not a Dakota person. I'm a Métis Nihial. My family's from Willow Bunch uh, in southern Saskatchewan. But I learned the Dakota language uh, through opportunity. 
because I wanted to be able to make prayers in the language and I learned it in, through prayer and I also learned it through the songs. Thank you for that beautiful, those beautiful songs that were here tonight. And um, you know, I was thinking of this story like a year, many years ago when uh, we would live, we were living in the Northwest Territories. And whenever you go somewhere, when you live in Yellowknife, it takes a long time to get there because everything is far. And so I was, used to think of things we could do while we're traveling a long time. So I was like, well, maybe we can learn some songs. So there's some Dakota songs that I really liked. And so I, I said, well, let's learn this song that I've been listening to on the CD. And so we were, we were, he was teaching me it and we were said, okay, let's sing it together. And so he kept stopping and saying, no, like pronounce it this way. And so then we'd start singing again. He'd say, stop, he'd say, no, pronounce it this way. And then we start to sing again. And he, I say, can you just let us sing right till the end? You know, I'll get the hang of it. And he said, well, you're singing about porridge. <laughs> so I had to listen to him. I had to listen to him. I, I believe that when we learn uh, one of our languages, whichever one it is, we are decolonizing our mind. That the way for us to move away from the social problems that we have in ourselves, in our communities, in our families, are through our own ways. And, our, and the culture and the ways of our people are in the language, the values and the beliefs and the, and the worldview, the way we understand the worldview. So whenever we are learning language, we are helping our people to move away from colonization and all the harms that have come to us. I was thinking about um, your comment about uh, the, not just to learn words. Our little Tokoja, he's 18 months old. He was over yesterday. So he's just getting language. And when he, when he says things, he doesn't say one word. He says, what is that? Look at this. I'm like, this is amazing. This little person is learning phrases at 18 months. And that reminds me tonight that uh, our brains are learn beginning to learn language. Are, they're wired for learning language at six months. So when we start teaching our babies and our, their mothers language, exposing them to people who are fluent in the language, in five years we'll have a whole crop of, of uh, children who are fluent. Because think of it, any child who's going to school is fluent in whatever language that they are being are speaking. So to me, uh, I believe that the answer to bringing back the language in a, in a fluent way is with our babies with our children. Thank you so much. I do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, we got to go take pictures. We're taking a picture somewhere. And look, Masani, I got a bag. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you for your work, Juan Bidi. So many amazing stories. Thank you so much. All right, the next name that we would like to acknowledge is Roger Roulette, who holds a very special place in our heart, and he's passed on. So this evening, uh, we're going to recognize his life's work. And... Uh, I'll invite Albert McLeod and Maureen Matthews to the stage, and I'm just going to quickly share a little bit about Roger. Roger was born and raised in McGregor, Manitoba. He went to school there, and later his family moved to Winnipeg when he was a teenager. All his life, he spoke Ojibwe with his family. Later, he made the Ojibwe language his life's work. 
He began teaching it in an evening course at the Manitoba Association for Native Languages in Winnipeg. He helped with skits that were performed at the association's native language festivals. He taught himself to read and write standardized Ojibwe and became a gifted translator and transcriber. Some of his many accomplishments include being a sessional instructor at the University of Manitoba, where he was an adjunct professor. He taught introductory and intermediate Ojibwe. He worked with Maureen Matthews at the Manitoba Museum, transcribing and translating elders and recording tapes. And he did plenty of his own recording of elders during that time as well. All during his professional life, he learned many dialects of Manitoba and Ontario. He taught himself sila syllabics, provided linguistic consultation, translation, and program development at the Indigenous Languages of Manitoba. And he researched for the oral history project for Treaty One, recording, transcribing, and translating elders' materials. He was co-author of many articles and authors of Ojibwe, Ojibwe grammar textbooks. So to honor him, Albert McLeod and Maureen Matthews, thank you. I'm trying to think what Roger would say. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he would remind me that humility is in order almost all the time. <laughs> but I uh, can't tell you how much I miss him. Uh, his family called him Tuki. And um, he was um, one of the smartest people I have ever met. He had a breadth of understanding of both uh, um, the Ojibwe language and many other languages. And also, he was politically very astute, and, uh, and he was just interested in everything. So he was an ideal partner for the projects that I worked with him on. I met him in 1992, and um, he transcribed. I was at that time working with CBC, making documentaries, and I had recorded um, hours and hours of Ojibwe conversation up in uh, Pongasi and on the Barrens River, and I really didn't know what I had. And Roger uh, transcribed the tape with me, um, and uh, he didn't know who I was either. Uh, uh, he, he, on the first transcripts I have, I'm lady number one. And there was my friend Jennifer Brown, lady number two. <laughs> and so eventually I got a name. Um, and, but Roger was brilliant at working for the radio, translating uh, people's words so that it wasn't wooden. It, he talked about the way that people were feeling as he was tra translating. And I'll never forget the time he was translating the, work of, uh, the words of a lady named Mangu Strang. And um, she had been talking to me about women's dance capes. And she, and she was talking about how they tinkled and what it felt like to be a dancer. And Roger said, you know, when he started the transcript, he said, she just wants you had to teach you how to dance. And then he talked about her saying, you know, th those, those capes, they were so beautiful. Wei Wei Xion is the word for them. And uh, just want to dance. So it's just, um, I like, happy to think about those moments. Um, Roger has left an enormous legacy. I, um, because the work we were doing was on the Barents River and associated with uh, work of an American anthropologist named Irving Hallowell, um, we placed all the tapes that I recorded on the Barents uh, at the American Philosophical Society and uh, one year they got a Mellon grant for a million dollars to transcribe or to, to translate their um, native language materials into um, digital format. And they uh, they did a huge project. But 500 hours of that was, was the material I gave them. And it was material that Roger has since transcribed. So that when Roger passed away, there were, we have 1,600 pages of transcripts and translation of the words of some wonderful speakers from the Upper Barrens River. It's a phenomenal legacy. and. Uh, I just miss Roger so much for his dedication to doing that. I, I could never have paid him for that. He did it for the love of those people. And that is the best motivation ever. Uh, thank you, Brennan, the baby holder. <laughs> uh, sure. I'll just hold it like this. So again, my name is Albert McLeod. I originally come from the Paw, Manitoba. Before that, a little village called Cormorant on the Bay Line, just about 40 minutes by road to the Paw. And uh, in my generation, 
in the 50s and 60s, uh, our parents were fluent, our grandparents, mostly even the white people in those days who worked in the Hudson's Bay trade or they were fluent in not one or two languages, but maybe four because trade depended on their ability to talk, to communicate and English. If the, if the whole community wasn't speaking English, it was no use. So they learned the languages. But by that time, the 60s, it was about assimilation to being white. And my parents uh, did not transfer that language to us. And there isn't much research about that time of uh, the thoughts behind that. In some places, uh, mostly more uh, isolated places, uh, children learned the language. But we were town people and we didn't learn the language, which was unfortunate because my grandmother, uh, who was a Hudson Bay uh, factor's wife, uh, was born in 1897. She only spoke Cree. So we missed out on uh, her stories. Uh, she would tell them, uh, but we couldn't understand what was she was saying. So what she did is she sang uh, Cree hymns and uh, Latin hymns. And that was her way of communicating with us, was through her singing through my childhood. Now, uh, today, there's 102,000 Indigenous people living in Winnipeg, the largest urban center. And we are going to experience a tsunami of culture uh, in North America. You know, I believe our ancestors left us the knowledge and the tools for the end of the disruption, the end of colonization. So that tsunami of knowledge is going to wave over us, upon us, and we're starting to see it now. And we will pick up those tools, that knowledge and those tools they left us. You know, the language speakers, the language teachers here tonight, and the work they're doing uh, in communities and in, and in educational institutions. And uh, I believe the world is going to need our languages and our worldview. Because in North America and South America, we've been here for tens of thousands of years, right? And we have that connection to that worldview, that understanding of land, weather, water, the ecosystem, the plants, right? Today we see Colorado River is uh, disappearing. Things 10 years ago people could never imagine. We see forest fires and floods in BC. Right? How many Indigenous people have had to come to Winnipeg as environmental refugees because of flooding or forest fires? Right. So uh, the work we did with Roger, we began through the support of Patricia Nguantz, who's also receiving an award tonight, and her work. She's written books. And uh, that's how we met Roger. And one of Roger's focuses was around addressing uh, the misinformation from pan-Indigenous knowledge. Because in some areas of the Americas, the language was destroyed by the residential schools. The culture was destroyed and forgotten. And Roger told me about the, the thing of that words and thoughts can become archaic, lost to memory, lost to time, especially if they are, you know, attacked by the government and the state, right? You couldn't say, you couldn't be heard to be saying certain things about ceremonies, or you could be targeted for punishment, right? So over time, there are places where, you know, there is no memory of a hand drum or a big drum or of healing ceremonies because the devastation was so severe. So Roger and I set out uh, about 20 years ago to do these sessions called Authenticating Ojibwe Beliefs and Values and Life Philosophies. And he came up with a model called the Anishinaabe Life Model. And it's based on his 40 years, over 40 years of working with Ojibwe elders and uh, listening to them tell the stories about the life in the eight, late 18, 1800s, when everybody only spoke Ojibwe and how they lived together. So he developed this framework and uh, we did nine sessions in Winnipeg with different audiences. And I would do the intro and then he would do his introduction of the model that's written in Ojibwe 
uh, the phonetics, and then the English. And after listening to Roger for an afternoon, you felt like you were time traveling, that he had taken you back to a place and time through this language, through his words that he described and explained to us of how people saw the world and related to each other, uh, treated each other, right? And after that workshop, you felt like you, you were just coming back to your body because he had taken you in your imagination, in your mind to another time and another place. So that was the gift that Roger had was his, his will, wanting to share that wealth, that vision that those elders had given him through those interviews uh, and their willingness to do an interview. You know, that's pretty awkward. It's kind of invasive when you have to tell a story about your life and, and have some kind of meaning to it that people will listen to. Uh, and Roger had done that for, for a very long time. When he got sick, um, and this is the thing, you know, Roger was only 63. You know, he was just at, at the high point of his career. And again, that's life, fate, right? When, and I visited him in the hospital, uh, and he said to me, he said, there's so much more to do. And that really told me, right? He loved life. He loved his career. He loved teaching about the Ojibwe philosophy and language and the modern world in which we live in, the 21st century. He said there are reservoirs that will preserve the Ojibwe language in Manitoba. There are communities where 99% of the youth speak their language, not just Ojibwe, but also Cree in this province and in this country, right? So with Maureen and the work that she's been doing at the Manitoba Museum, and she is the cultural, the curator of cultural anthropology, and again had worked closely with Roger for many years in writing books, uh, transcribing, interpreting, all of those things. So again, Roger left an amazing legacy, right, that will guide our youth into the future, right, with a strong foundation. And I believe that learning Indigenous languages can save lives of our youth, those who may be lost, depressed, suicidal, you know, seeking a path, a meaning in their life of who they are as Canadians, as Indigenous people, as First Nations, Inuit or Métis people, right? And the language, it can be medicine. Sometimes it takes one word, three words, a sentence. One time I asked Roger, I said, is there a way that Ojibwe say, I'm sorry? Because I never hear it. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> he says, yes, there is. And he did give that to me. And it says, I, I regret. That's about re regret or something. Anyway. <laughs> so, so again, our, as mentioned earlier, our youth's minds are like sponges. I think Pahan talked about that. It's natural to them. It's inherent. It's an innate ability to pick up language. And I have a granddaughter when she was about nine. She was in North Kedolan Park, and she was taking Ojibwe class at Riverbend School. So they were in the park with their their father and her sister. And uh, she said to her uncle, she says, you know, there's an indigenous man there, she said. Should I ask him how to say dog in Ojibwe? She said, okay, go and ask him. She goes up to him and she says, hey, mister, how do you say animush? <laughs> See, they don't know, like, you know, she already knew the word in her brain, in her brain, she knew the word, right? So that, that is the potential uh, and the, of passing it on in a good way to the younger generations. Roger's haunt was the Pony Corral, which is gone, sadly, as, as long with Roger. I was just walking by it the other day, thinking about how he used to hold court there. And we'd all go and worship at the altar of Roger. And you had to be very quick-witted. You know, there's a thing among Indigenous people when you meet in a group, there's a competition. And, you know, it's never talked about. In seconds, you have to make the wittiest observation of what's happening, right? And the one who does it wins. And it happens in seconds, right? And Roger was really good at that. Uh, and uh, 
So again, uh, you know, and when people die, I believe their work, you know, their vision is done for that time. And to respect Roger is to accept that he is being transformed into a spirit being. He will be in that place where he needs to be, whether with those ancestors, those people he interviewed, that world he understood, or just flying around this universe, you know, going around Mars, you know? And that really is part of that vision that Roger talked about. So just in closing, oh, I wanted to say about the, the saving life piece. In Roger's model, he shares this term, Minaguisi win. And he says it means given or received from the divine. That predates colonization. That establishes that indigenous people had a connection to the spiritual realm, the world of creation. And the Pope was here, you know, last summer and apologized for damning that language, damning this term that established indigenous people already had a connection to the spiritual realm, to our ancestors. I was at the Thunderbird house maybe five years ago and we had a sweat lodge. And I was outside and it was night, kind of a dark night. And the gate was open and this man came about 40 years old and he was crying. And this is what he said. He says, I don't want to die. And that it was as clear and visceral a statement about where he had arrived in his life as a young man, being indigenous in Canada. He knew being homeless, on the street, using drugs, he would die. A fact. And his soul and his spirit were afraid of that. Because he didn't have to. That was not the legacy of our treaties, to die young in Winnipeg, to die in Treaty 1. So I took him inside the Thunderbird house, and there was not much I could do for him at the time. And I said, I'll tell you one thing that you never learned in high school is this term, Minigawisi win, given or received from the divine. From the second you were born, you have always had the capacity, the ability to petition the spiritual world to help you in your life, to ask what you need. You know, maybe it is just with a little bit of tobacco. You make that offering and that ask, and the spirits will provide. That's what the church destroyed in our youth, in our children. And that's why he was on the street in Winnipeg. And that's why he was so afraid. Because he had not received that instruction as a child, that teaching, that he had a direct connection to the spiritual world. And he could receive what he needed. So yes, language revitalization is important, but it can save lives. Not just in North America, in South America as well. In the last part of Roger's Nishnabi life model is the end of life stage. It's called Bumpy Win or Survival or Overcoming. And we all know we just came through COVID-19. And when we began, we all thought we would be here this month, this year. But some are not with us after two and a half years. Right? So... The first strategy of survival and overcoming is Goshi Weiwin, overcoming our fears, real or imagined. No one's wearing masks in his room today, so we're pretty comfortable <laughs> with dealing with our fears, real or imagined. Some people were earlier. The next way of surviving, and survive our winters, minus 48, minus 50, in a teepee. No electricity, right? None of that for thousands of years. That's how people survived. Now, this is a long one. Nanakatawakapachewin, the observant study of events. Research. The Truth and Reconciliation 94 Calls for Action. 
the amount to, the national inquiry for murdered and missing indigenous women and girls 231 calls for justice that is research about our future thank you Albert. on our way to in deduction what are we going to do with our research we're going to make those calls for action and calls for justice alive for our children so they do not have to suffer what we suffered nanaka kon win honoring and giving thanks despite our labors our troubles our struggles especially in the winter when there's no protein, meat, or berries left, we eat fish till the spring and the muskrats come back. And that's what we're doing tonight. We are honoring and giving thanks. We're slowing down our busy lives to take a few hours to honor some of our leaders who are helping that tsunami of knowledge come into the 21st and the 22nd century our future. Thank you for helping us do that. So that food we ate is a metaphor. The, our elder created the spirit plate. That is to nourish us in the present, but it's also to remember when we sat at these tables with our loved ones who are no longer with us today. When we shared our stories, when we shared our love with each other, and that's what these gifts are. We're honoring and giving thanks because we do take that time to support our champions who, as we learned earlier, sometimes are denigrated for trying to bring the languages back. Right? Thank you, Albert. We appreciate that. Great. Thank you, guys. You're uh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good to know you. Thank you, Albert and, and Maureen. So you guys can take a picture with them? Okay. Do we take a picture? All right. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to invite you to uh, share just another round of applause just to acknowledge Roger. So we have a few guests that didn't make it this evening, so I just want to acknowledge them by name. Aldrich Leesk, who's not here this evening, he's a respected Swampy Cree language instructor. So um, thank you to Aldrich. Patricia Ninjawants is an Ojibwe speaker from Lac Sewell First Nation. So thank you to Patricia, who's not here tonight. I'd like to acknowledge Kevin Takan, who's not here this evening as well. Kevin is a traditional knowledge keeper and elder. And so if you would just um, join me in a round of applause just to acknowledge those folks who are not here. And for the next presentation, I'd like to invite up the board and staff. So any board and staff members of Urban Shaman, if you can please come to the stage. And I'd like to invite Debbie Keeper to the mic. Debbie is the interim director of the Urban Shaman. So if you're on the board or if you're a staff member, make your way over. <laughs> All right, hurry up, hurry up, come on, come on, we want to hear the band. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, we're going to make this brief, but uh, on this evening, uh, we also wanted to acknowledge Louis Ogama. <laughs> um, so for those of you that may not know, uh, Lewis had the original vision to create an Aboriginal artist-run centre in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Urban Shaman Contemporary Aboriginal Art was incorporated on March 7th, 1996, with the help 
January 6th. Well, the paper says <laughs> March, okay? <laughs> I was there. Okay. <laughs> okay, there it is. He said January 6th. Okay. I will defer. <laughs> uh, so, um, Lewis had the help of many supporters who I'm not going to list here, <laughs> but you all know who you are. Um, this gallery has provided over 26 years of exposure for Indigenous curators and artists, not only on a lo local level, but on a national and international stage as well. Uh, we are one of Winnipeg's uh, hidden jewels, and we hear that all the time. So on behalf of the staff and Board of Urban Shaman Contemporary Art, we thank you, Lewis, and present you this gift in honor of your contribution to the Indigenous arts community. Here, here. <laughs> Give the man his snagging blanket. Or I can hold it. Hello. Uh, bonjour. I'm actually from Northwest Ontario. I'm also gone through residential schools. Uh, let's see, I guess 70, was that 68 till 74 and um, in Ontario. Uh, let's see, what can I say about languages? I grew up with it at the beginning, and then of course, gradually started losing it. And then came to Winnipeg in 75 with the exodus of everybody coming into these larger centers, and been here since 75, back and forth to Ontario, of course, because it's so close. But I kept in touch with a lot of stories from my, my mom and my Kokum and my dad. I got all the legends from my dad's side. In fact, Patricia is my auntie, it's my dad's sister. and. Uh, so I, we got, they, they did a lot of legends, so I, I grew up listening to legends uh, and traumatized by them as well. <laughs> I used to have all these dreams of legends. Um, but I've, I've also been gone through a lot of things and experiencing a lot of things like Anishinaabe Park. I was actually there when I was 12 when it happened. And so I've, I, a lot of this stuff started sticking in my head about all these experiences that were experimenting that, uh, was happening in the community, and um, and thinking about languages, uh, uh, I want to keep this short. But uh, I was thinking about a friend of mine. His uh, his mom's from Long Plains, and his dad, I think, is from Saigon. And uh, he was so I was having a chat with him, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, because I'm not immersed in the language, so it's very. It, I try to try. I try my best to speak it. But I said, you know, you should try and learn your language too, like in Shinabe. And he says, well, he says, it's too hard. I'm getting too old and all this, all this stuff. But I looked at him and I said, well, but you speak Klingon. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not even a real language. <laughs> but he does. He speaks Klingon real language. He started laughing. That was so funny. And uh, I said, you, it's just repetition. He's just, if you learn the language, you just start putting it in group patterns and being able to articulate it. So uh, we had a very funny discussion about that. And so, yeah, and so, you know, my family and through the work that we've done here at Urban Shaman, I mean, it started way back in, I guess, 89, 90, in terms of uh, my research work. And my residential school thing happened in 91, 92. I started creating this piece and, and then uh, actualized it back in 97. And I did a show in Urban Shaman and I actually did the translation with a friend of mine from, I think from Rainy River. He did a translation of the piece I wrote for the Regeneration Show, which was my, my family's experience in residential schools. And actually we had it at the, at the, what you call it? 5500? The 5500 Group Show. And I put it at the centerpiece because it was, uh, for me it was part of that uh, experience of uh, acknowledging my uh, family and that whole piece itself is an altar to my family because it's in generations and done in birch bark books of my Kokum in the east and my, my parents were in the same school in the 50s and us guys were in the 60s and 70s and then 
my little sister and my nephews and nieces are in, in the north and that's how we use the medicine wheel the Manopamata is when the teachings from that whole experience within that piece so it's so the, it's been very uh, that show has been really close to me like I said it's been about since 92 I guess is when I first showed it in uh, the thesis art show in, at the U of M so it's um, probably about 31 years <laughs> yeah 31 years thereabouts so 30 years so it's, it's quite this it's served its uh, purpose of even the birch bark books have stayed for a long time so it's pretty amazing but I learned like I said I learned all my experiences and stories from my family in Ontario and uh, I know Roger Roulette as well I knew him since 90 92 and uh, I actually know what you're talking about Albert because he shared those same this, his knowledge with me back in the early days about uh, working with a, a lot of elders and so uh, again picking up a lot of this information and so with that I'll I'd like to say miigwech thank you very much oh. oh my board member Josh here and staff I gotta acknowledge my staff people here so it's uh, I'm glad they they're here tonight thank you Bingo bag. My baby. <laughs> okay, congratulations to Lewis Ogama, and thank you for all of your work. And that's it for our presentations today. So thank you to the Urban Shaman for having me host your event tonight. Thank you to the Language Keepers for all of your amazing work that has been done over the years and that continues to inspire youth of the future. Thank you to Carolyn Moore and Jojo Wilson for opening us up in a good way. Um, we have more entertainment, um, no need for our um, like a, a, a big intro for our band. We're going to hear from the incredible Seaweed Band in a few moments. Uh, for a closing prayer, I'd like to invite Albert McLeod, and um, he's going to close our event with a prayer. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, back again. So this part is... Uh, there's something Roger told me about uh, that understanding of our relationship with the spiritual world. So this is a closing, and uh, what it is, is at the beginning we had uh, a drum song. Uh, we had smudge, and we had uh, invocation from our elder. And part of that is uh, we are calling spirit to be in this room with us, to witness what we're doing, trying to be human, trying to be thankful, trying to honor each other for our work. Because our lives are not, we're not here forever. You know, we will all one day begin that journey, right? We will all one day be spirit. So at this time, you know, I believe the spirits are in the room with us. We can't see them, but that's what the understanding is that that sage went out, that smoke traveled, awoke those spirits that will be with us tonight to see us, to hear us, to witness, and to help us if they can. Same with the invocation, the petition to join us, the drum song, the voice, the words, the sound of the drum to wake those spirits up, the ones that are meant to be with us tonight. This closing is to acknowledge they were here. Uh, uh, Roger said the, the spirits are amorphous. They don't have a shape we can recognize. They're not replications of human, like other religions. The sun, can you put it in your pocket? Thunder, lightning, can you put it in your pocket? Those are the ones that give us life. 
And so in the closing, as we thank them, uh, we send them back to where they came from to be here tonight. So they return to spirit. The work of humans is our responsibility from this day forward. And they have returned now. Because we're going to hear CCR. <laughs> I'm not responsible for the playlist. But, that, but really, that, that is the closing, right? To, to, clo to close those doorways, the north, the west, the south, and the east, to close them now and let those spirits rest. Miigwech.
big thank you to uh, Ur uh, Urban Shaman for having us down here and uh, play some music for you guys tonight. Hope you guys enjoy. All right, here's a song by Robbie Robertson called "The Shape I'm In." <clears throat>
shape on man. Okay, so the dance floor is right in front of us here. Uh, we like to see every last one of you guys out on the dance floor at some point uh, throughout the evening. Here's a song I wrote. This one's called The Magic and the Music.
Here's a song I wrote, this was on the radio. See? 
wrote this along back in those days, the song that kind of broke the whole uh, thing open is a song called Advantage Line, right? Also written by Robbie Robertson.
All we got Tom doing with, with his fiddle in his hand. So we got a whole bunch of folks out here. We got a nice, clean, brand new dance floor. Hardly been used. It's a brand new place. How about a round of applause for the Long Plains First Nation? Good to done, eh? What the hell? Nice, really nice. And we're on reservation land. Really, the whole country. Yeah, all right, here's one called the St. Anne Reel. It's not far off the road.
Here's one written by Jagger and Richards. I used to wear I do this Jagger. No, right? No, I'll break my back. Here we go. High and dry. Oh 
Cool. So I will collect the camera. Yeah. I can get the camera. Yes, it be Right here. I'll, uh, <laughs> Other tray 